Hello and welcome to this undergraduate skills video where we are going to learn about various basic laboratory calculations which will be extremely useful as you progress through your degree. Now why do you need to know about these calculations? Well it will allow you to analyse scientific data and once it has been analysed you can then start to understand it and once you understand it you can start to draw conclusions on what the data shows. So without further ado, in this particular video we are going to focus on calculating the standard deviation and for this you will need to understand what the arithmetic mean and normal distribution are. Therefore I advise you watch the associated videos before continuing. Ok, so before we look at the standard deviation we need to understand what we mean by the term deviation. Now on a very basic level, deviation is a term we use to describe the difference between an individual data value and the mean value of the data set. And to just visualise this, here we can see two data points in yellow and the deviation is the numerical difference between the data value and the mean value. So a key question now is what is the standard deviation? Well, it is a measure of how dispersed or spread out data values are from the mean value of a particular data set. And to simplify this, we could almost look at it as a kind of average of all the individual deviations within a data set. Now this definition is similar to some other calculations which look at deviations such as the variance of a population or sample. However, in the biological sciences, standard deviation is often preferred because the calculated value for a data set standard deviation is in the same units as the data itself. And this essentially means it can be used effectively during data visualization. So quite often we will use the mean value to show the average value of a data set and the standard deviation to show how spread out the data is. Now before we move on to calculate the standard deviation, one thing is crucial. Our data set must have a normal distribution. Now this means it will have a bell-shaped distribution curve, where data values closer to the mean will occur more frequently than data values which deviate further from the mean. Ok, so now that we know these key bits of information, we can move on to calculating the standard deviation and we do this using a rather complex looking equation. However, don't worry, once you understand what is happening and break it down to constituent components, it becomes very manageable. So what is happening in this equation? Well, the standard deviation is essentially the square root of the sum of our data values minus the mean of the data values, giving us our deviation, squared, divided by one of two numbers. It can be the number of data values in our data set or it can be the number of data values minus 1. Now, how do we know when to use n and how do we know when to use n minus 1? Well, it all comes down to whether the data values you observed represent a sample of a larger population or the entire population itself. And determining this can be easier said than done. So a population in scientific terms refers to much more than a group of people. It is essentially an entire group that could be observed, whereas a sample is a subgroup of the population that could be observed. Now obviously it's better to look at an entire population as it is more accurate as you are analysing all of the possible data. But sometimes this is not possible because the population is too big, the experiment is too costly or it's too time consuming. For these situations we use a sample of the population and use this to make inferences on the population as a whole. So as an example, let's say we take two 10ml vials of blood from someone's arm, one before and one after an experimental treatment. And let's say we want to compare the number of monocyte cells in the two vials. Each vial is its own population, however it will be near impossible to count every monocyte in each of these populations. So we take a small sample from each and we count the number of cells in these samples. Now, when it comes to our mathematical equation, this n-1 acts as a sort of correction factor which is highly influential when there are only a few observations. However, as we add more data points to our data set, it becomes less influential as we naturally get closer to the analysis of an entire population. 
So what do we mean by this? Well, if we were to make five observations which represent a population, then n would be equal to five. But if these observations were a sample of a population, it would be five minus one, meaning n would equal four. If on the other hand, we were to make 500 observations which represents the entire population, then n would be equal to 500. And again, if these observations were a sample of a population, it would be 500 minus one, meaning n would equal 499. Now hopefully from this you can see that if we were to divide a number by five and the same number by four, we'd end up with quite different numbers. However, if we were to divide the same number by 500 and 499, then the difference would be relatively negligible. And this is what we mean when we say it becomes less influential the more data values you have. Now, to help make sense of our standard deviation equation and what we just learnt, we are going to calculate the standard deviation of two example data sets. So in our first example, we have a student who is counting the number of monocytes in a patient's blood sample using a microscope and hemocytometer. During their first count, they note 235 monocytes per microliter of blood. To try and increase the accuracy of their data, they perform repeat counts on different blood samples from the same patient, noting 204, 214, 256 and 251 monocytes per microliter. Now following on from this experimental counting, the student calculated the mean to be 232 cells and now wants to know how dispersed their data is, i.e. what is the standard deviation of monocytes per microliter. Now before we start transferring information into our equation, we need to determine what we are looking at and whether we need to use the equation for population standard deviation or sample standard deviation. So in this instance, the student is counting five different samples which come from a larger blood sample. Therefore, we are going to select the equation for sample standard deviation, which we can now populate with all of the information from our example. So x minus x bar becomes our data values minus the mean data value, i.e. our deviation, repeated for each data value, and n becomes the number five, as this is the number of data values we observed. Now to make everything easier, we can start simplifying this equation by calculating everything in the brackets on the top line of the equation. Now this still has some work to do. Our next step is to continue simplifying the top line of the equation by squaring each of the values in brackets. Which also removes any negative values, so that we are left with a number of positive values which can now be added together, giving us a value of 2054. Next, we simplify the bottom line of the equation, so 5 minus 1 is 4, allowing us to divide 254 by 4, giving us 513.5. Now at this point, we have actually calculated the sample variance value and could report this as a measure of dispersion. However, it is not in the same unit as our data values, and so in order to convert this value into something more useful, we must complete our equation and find the square root of 513.5, which is 22.7, or more specifically, 22.7 monocytes per microliter. Now, interpretation of this number can be difficult, but in general terms, the lower the value, the less variation there is in the data. Basically, the data values are similar to the mean with little deviation. On the flip side, the higher the value, the more variation there is in the data, which basically means the data values are more spread out with larger deviations between the data and the mean. So let's quickly look at a second example. Here we have a second student who is repeating the same experiment but with a different patient's blood sample. The student was a bit slower in the lab and only managed to complete four cell counts, identifying 180, 217, 250 and 281 monocytes per microliter. Following this experimental counting, the student calculated the mean to be 232 cells and now wants to know how dispersed their data is, i.e. what is the standard deviation of monocytes per microliter. Now just like our previous example, we are going to calculate the sample standard deviation using the following equation, which we can now populate with all of the information from our example. 
So x minus x bar becomes our data values minus the mean data value, which is our deviation, repeated for each data value, and n becomes the number 4, as this is the number of data values observed. Now again, to make things easier, we can start simplifying this equation by calculating everything in the brackets on the top line of the equation. We can then simplify this further by squaring each of our values in the brackets. And as we talked about earlier, the squaring of values removes any negative values from our equation. Now we can add up each of the numbers on the top line of the equation, giving us a value of 5,654. Next, we need to simplify the bottom line of the equation. So 4 minus 1 is 3, allowing us to divide 5,654 by 3, giving us 1,884.7. Now at this point, just like in our previous example, we have actually calculated the sample variance value and could report this as a measure of dispersion. However, we want to complete our equation and find the standard deviation by calculating the square root of this value, which is 43.4, or more specifically, 43.4 monocytes per microliter. Now, if we compare the standard deviation of monocytes per microliter counted by student 2 in our second example to that calculated by student 1 in our first example, we can see they differ from one another, with the standard deviation of student 2 cell counts twice that of student 1's, despite having the same calculated mean values. And if we bring up the raw data for each of these data sets, we can see for the first example, the cell counts are closer to the mean, resulting in a lower standard deviation value, which essentially means the data values in the data set are less dispersed. Then on the flip side, the cell counts for the second student in our second example are further from the mean, resulting in a higher standard deviation value, which essentially means the data values in the data set are more dispersed. And essentially, when used in conjunction with the mean, the standard deviation allows us to see how spread out and variable our data is, and that is because it relates directly to the bell-shaped curve we saw earlier. Here we can see the graph for a standard deviation that is relatively small. This means the data is less variable and less spread out. Basically, many of the data values are similar and close to the mean. However, if we compare this data set to one with a larger deviation, we can see the bell-shaped curve is wider with a reduced peak. This means the data is more variable and more spread out. Basically, the data values differ from the mean value a lot more. Now one final note when using standard deviation. This calculated value lets us know that if we went above or below the mean value by one standard deviation, then it would include 68.2% of the data values in our data set. So if we use our second example here, the mean value was 232 monocytes per microliter. If we went one standard deviation below, so 232 minus 43.4, and one standard deviation above, so 232 plus 43.4, 68.2% of our data values will fall between the values of 188.6 and 275.4. And this is because it relates directly to the shape of the bell curve and the area underneath it. Now we can go further with our standard deviation. So if we went above or below the mean value by two standard deviations, then it would include 95.4% of the data values in our data set. So for this example, 95.4% of data value observations should fall between 145.2 and 318.8 monocytes per microliter. And that is essentially standard deviation, an indicator of how spread out our data is around a mean. And with that, we come to the end of this basic laboratory calculations video. Hopefully you found the content useful, easy to understand, and can use it going forward in your data analysis. Thank you for watching, stay safe, and I hope you have a great day.